You're listening to Psych with Mike. If you enjoy the show, then help us out. Go to Apple Podcasts and rate us and leave us a comment. That is so beneficial for the show, and we would really, really appreciate it. But in addition to that, you can follow us on Twitter, at Psych with Mike. You can like the Facebook page, at Psych with Mike. And now you can even catch us on TikTok, at Psych with Mike. So please subscribe to all of those different ways to stay connected to the show. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Welcome to the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. How are you today? I'm doing really, really good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. You just got back from camping. Yes, once again. You camp a lot. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And you camp uh, differently than a lot of people camp. So a lot of people think that buying an RV is camping. in today's world, exactly. Yeah. We tent camp. Yeah. Uh, But we tent camp in, in state parks where... Almost every other campsite is a huge RV. It's a portable home. Mm-hmm. It's like in a trailer park in the 1950s. Uh, and some of them are magnificent mm-hmm. pieces of equipment. They really are. But what we talk about, we like to sit around the fire at night and listen to an audio book or talk to each other, carry on. Whoa, talk to each other. There's a novel concept. Indeed it is. Uh, but in those RVs, after I mean, you rarely see people outside. They because they got watch TV. satellite connections, yeah, right? They're exactly. watching freaking Netflix. Doing the same thing they were doing at home. Yeah. Why? Why leave? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. And uh, so I just recently read an article. Um, you know how people will tow things behind their RVs. Mm-hmm. And so this couple. Did you read this? This couple from Florida bought a brand new fifty thousand dollar Jeep, and they were flat towing it behind their RV. And they left it in gear, and the thing blew up, and it literally disintegrated. No, it got so hot, the motor exploded, and it literally disintegrated the Jeep. I mean, yeah, it was it unbelievable. Sound like a well-made Jeep? <laughs> well, I think it <laughs> <laughs> means <laughs> that, don't, that don't tow a car in gear. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. When when they took it to the dealership, the dealership estimated that the engine may have been turning somewhere between eighty thousand and a hundred thousand RPMs for an extended period of time, which is a not, lot. I don't think they're made to do they're that. They're not. not made, <laughs> they're not constructed yeah. to do okay. that. Yeah, yeah, but. Anyway, that was... So the message there is that if you go camping a lot, a lot of the people that you go camping around and among may not be the sharpest. Yeah, knife they in the might drawer. not be. Okay. Even though they've got a really nice RV. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you guys camp, mm-hmm. what is the benefit of that that you feel like that you get? Well, there are so many. Uh I love being out in nature. I love listening to the birds, the animals. You go camping at night. The tent that we have, we can take the rain cap off of it, and we have a mesh roof, and we can look out and see the stars. Uh, and we, we can hear owls hoot and dogs bark and coyotes yelp. And, and then in the daytime, we sit in a comfortable place and read books, or we go for long walks in mm-hmm. the countryside. It's just delightful. Mm-hmm. And, uh, there even are... Uh, cooking classes that you can take for cooking with a Dutch oven. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, Michael, uh, shoot, I'm drawing a, blanking on his name. He's on the Food Network. Mm. Uh, he's Iron Chef. Uh, I'm wanting to say Smirconish because I listen to that on a different network. Yeah, But um, he has a, a series of cooking shows that are available on, on YouTube mm-hmm. for uh, Michael Simon mm-hmm. that, are, that are all about cooking outside mm. on a grill. I mean, full full course meals, desserts, Mm -hmm. uh, appetizers, salads, Mm -hmm. everything fixes it all outside. Mm -hmm. You can do some marvelous things. I have a good friend that uh, I went to high school and college with who now camps all the time. And he and his wife are campground hosts at a couple of places Mm -hmm. in Arkansas. And uh, Duke is a phenomenal campground cook, Dutch oven cook. He had us for dinner and he made... Uh, a soup that was phenomenal in the wintertime we were camping. And then he made a cake in a Dutch oven. Uh, it, it, I mean, it just really is good. Mm-hmm. I'm not in that category. I can grill a burger. Yeah. My wife is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you guys 
eat well when you go camping. You're not. You we don't are complain. not deprived. Right. We are merely depraved. Yeah. Yeah. And so you believe that there is significant restorative function that is associated with being able to go camping and that that is I as do. good as going on vacation to oh, it the is Caribbean. a type of vacation when yeah. i was a kid growing up it's the only kind of vacation we mm-hmm. ever had you know, we didn't have money to go to some resort somewhere uh, but i still love doing it that way and i think modern men and at least in our communities isolate ourselves too much from nature we're yeah. inside all the time we have air conditioning mm-hmm. all the time we don't know the seasons we don't know the days we don't know the weather conditions we don't know the trees and the animals and the flowers i mean if you get out and and go for hikes mm-hmm. uh, it helps but if you go camping and you spend two or three mm-hmm. days in the woods it's a really yeah. good experience and my wife and i want to start doing that uh we had invested in some of it we're, last we're year we're going again in two weeks yeah. yeah and and we're we're really excited to actually get out and and try it my wife so i'm expecting you to call or cam to call and say damn ticks damn snakes damn dogs well i mean but you guys don't do that no and so those things are all a part of if you're looking for a reason to be miserable and uncomfortable you can find it you can find it absolutely right so uh would you say that camping has helped your self-image I don't know. It's helped my uh, perspective. Uh, it's helped me fe- feel more energized and more relaxed at the same time. If mm-hmm. that's not paradoxical, it's not an oxymoron. But you don't think that being out in nature and cooking your own food that that makes you feel like oh, if there were a zombie apocalypse, maybe I actually <laughs> could take care of myself? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> well, I, and I'm not being facetious. I mean, I'm, yes, I'm, you are. No, I'm, I'm actually not. I am. I am with the zombie apocalypse. Yeah. But I would think going out in nature and living that way and well, not that, in the RV. And now you can be talking about our friend Paul Schinkelberg because yeah. he goes out and like kills the meat and brings well, it home. That's that skins it, cuts it up, cooks it, eats it. I mean, he goes and catches the fish and comes back and cleans it and prepares it, cooks right. it and eats it. I mean, he has all those skills. He is a mountain man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not. I'm just a witness. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I give uh, what I hope is supportive perspective and complimentary advice. Mm-hmm. Yes. But you, you don't feel like that camping makes you feel better about yourself? I think it does. Uh, I, no, I didn't say it didn't. I no. just said I hadn't thought about it. Mm. Well, so from your understanding what would you say is the foundation of a person's self-image their identity development well i think i think there are a couple things Uh, one is whatever script you were given about yourself and your self-worth in your childhood from your parents your teachers your church from the adult authorities in your community who looked at you and said, no, I don't want you dating my daughter son. Mm-hmm. You, you're, uh, or when you get out of prison, give me a call. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, uh, yeah give me a call. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of it is the script that was internalized in your childhood and adolescence and whether or not you've revisited that and edited it as an adult. And then I think the other piece of it is the degree of uh, integrity with which you live. If you are walking in or with integrity, if you're internally consistent and honest with yourself, not necessarily others. I'm not saying, well, you know, the church teaches us that confession is good for the soul. I find that very often confession just stirs up crap that doesn't ever go away. Uh, So my thought is, if you work from a position of personal integrity, then you have more Mm self-esteem than you deserve to. Mm-hmm. Because you, it's a consistent resonance. But I think that that's, that's a really, though, important thing that you are saying that I'm not sure people, A, think about, or B, really understand. When you're saying integrity, like Proverbs, what is it, Proverbs 20, verse 7, I think, is my, it, it, the, the verse is, uh, a man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. And I've always 
used that as hopefully a defining mantra for my life. I believe that integrity is really important. Being able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I like that person. Okay. But you're talking about this as internal consistency. That means that you do the things that you say you're going to do, that you believe the things that you say are important to you. So if I see you, I know what is important to you because I see your behavior. And if you tell me that honesty is important to you, but then you lie to people, that is not consistent. That's not integrity. So your behavior has to match. Well, we used to have these conversations with parents doing family counseling all the time. You know, your children are always watching Mm -hmm. what you do, not listening to what you say. So when you say to your child, don't lie, don't lie, don't ever lie, always tell the truth, don't lie, and the phone rings and you say to your child, tell them I'm not home. Exactly. That is a mixed message. Right. If you say, don't steal, don't steal, don't steal another man's stuff, don't Mm -hmm. steal another man's product. And then they say, Daddy, I need some ink pens and paper for a school project. Oh, I'll bring those home from the office. Right. And you bring them home, and it says, Missouri Pacific Railroad on the principal. You know, and you've obviously or stolen Or you say, don't drink and drive, don't drink and drive, yeah. don't drink and drive. Go out to dinner. And you go out to dinner and yeah. have a cup of wine. Yeah, exactly. Glass so, of wine. So those mixed messages mm-hmm. go out. The, the technical distinction that I would make, when I work with clients, But always trying to talk to them about the shoulds that we hear in our head. Mm. You should behave this way. You should feel Mm -hmm. this way. You should believe these things about whatever you want. Oh, Oh, you just. Hello. (laughs) I should not have done that. Uh, You were getting into it. So for It's bad uh, bad radio, but if you were watching on the YouTubes, uh, Brett was talking with his hands. You should subscribe to YouTube so you can see. And and, and he punched the mic. Punched it right in the face. There it is. So anyway. So there, I would try to make the distinction. There are two classifications uh-huh. of shoulds. Mm-hmm. There are the have-to shoulds that are imposed upon you by the script, written mm-hmm. for you by others. And the choose-to shoulds, which are the shoulds that you impose on your own behavior from within yourself. Mm-hmm. In order to be a good Christian, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. That is a have-to should. I have some neighbors I don't love. Does that make me a bad Christian? Mm-hmm. Do I need to deal with that? Am I walking out of integrity? If I run around telling everybody, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. I believe in love. I don't like that son of a bitch. You know, it's just totally not acceptable to me. You're mm-hmm. not living with integrity. But if I put limitations on myself about my responses to others because they come from within me, mm-hmm. it's the choose to shoulds. Mm-hmm. I choose to be the kind of person that doesn't lose my temper and drive with road rage. Mm -hmm. I choose to be the kind of person that doesn't assault my neighbor because they didn't cut their grass. Mm -hmm. And and I have got to walk with integrity according to those. And And I find camping and being out in nature and being more grounded uh helps me live a choose-to life better than I lived it when I wasn't doing that. So would you say to somebody in therapy... Eventually, not initially, yeah. but eventually that all shoulds are choose to because even the scripted shoulds are cho- you choose well, whether to buy a, into the script. You There's an imposition in terms of options you might have on mm-hmm. your behaviors, a restriction on your behaviors. I think they're healthier and more grounded when they come from within yourself. I choose not to eat pie mm-hmm. because I choose to limit my caloric intake today mm-hmm. and, and not a forever, but a today. That's coming from inside me. I don't resent it. And that's how I tell clients to recognize the difference. If it's an imposed should or have Mm -hmm. to from someone else as a position of power, you will resent it and Mm -hmm. you will be angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You may follow the behavior that you're required to follow because you're required to follow it. There'll be punishments if you don't. You're going to hell. But if it comes from within you, you don't resent it. Right. Right. You, you, and you're at peace that. with that. Yeah. You're like, yeah. you know what? I'm just not having pie today. I, I've always thought that and, and always told people that that is where resentment comes from yeah. is you, you will resent something you don't feel like you have a choice in. Right. And so if you then tr- choose to look at a situation as I choose to do this, yeah. you can't ever resent and it. And then you have good self-esteem yeah. Yeah. because you feel grounded in the choices that you're making. You don't feel driven by somebody else. Right. I, and, you, you just work with adolescents all the time. I 
and say, and they, they come in, they're angry with their parents, they're angry with their teachers, they're angry with the police department, whatever they're angry about, but their anger is corrupting their ability to function. Yeah. And I would say to them, you're riding in the back seat of the car that somebody else is driving. Mm-hmm. You need to think about that. Mm-hmm. Do you want to drive the car? Get in front. But if you get in front and you drive the car, you have to be responsible for the choices that you made. Mm-hmm. You no longer have the excuse to blame it on, on bad teachers or bad parents or bad cops. You have to say, I'm going to drive responsibly. I'm not going to drink and drive. Mm-hmm. Can you do that? If you want the freedom to make the choices, you have to pay the prices. And that means you have to get in the driver's seat mm-hmm. and drive the car. Because you'll always find somebody to drive it for you. So let's go to our break, and then when we get back, i got a question. All right, Michael. I've had a number of people approach me and say, are you the guy that's on that Psych with Mike with that other guy that's on Psych with Mike? (laughs) That other guy. That other guy. And I I said, yes, I am, actually. And they said, well, how do you do that? I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, how do you do what you do? And I said, we've both been in private practice, and we've taught in counseling programs at different universities for over 30 years. We just have a lot of experience, and what we do is we sit down and talk about what matters to us from our perspective about being clinicians, what are the clinical skills that you need to have, and what matters about trying to find ways to help people live better lives, less painfully, more functionally. And that's what we talk about when we do Psych with Mike. Well, that sounds awesome, and you can tell those people from the other guy, thank you, and that's very flattering. All right. If it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Okay, we're back. And uh, so as I'm listening to you talk about this, the thing that I am wondering is in your experience, because I know how I would answer this question, so I'm interested in how you would answer it. Do you find that it is, can clients hear what you're saying about integrity and take responsibility for that? Or are they so conditioned to believe that they're victims, right? Right. And and this is imposed well, on me. Powerless. Yeah. yeah. See, that's why words matter. Yeah. Words yeah. are so critical. Right. Yeah. The, the word that so many of them have heard growing up is responsibility. I b i l i t y, and I try to get them to change that word in their head to response ability. Mm-hmm. A b i l i t y, because if you are able to respond then you have the choice Mm -hmm. of options. If it's an ability, it's imposed. Mm -hmm. And so when I try to explain this, if I do a good job, if I do my job of explaining it cogently Mm -hmm. and coherently, yes, they can hear it. Yes, they can see it. They may resist accepting it because it's not a a one trial learning. Mm -hmm. It's not an epiphany like, oh, you know, put your hands on my head and heal me. It's, it's like, okay, I can, I, can see a path forward now. But, and, and so I'm actually going to do uh, a radio segment tomorrow. And, and one of the things that uh, the host, Randy Tobler, you yeah. know who Randy yeah. is, uh, wanted to talk about was this idea of victimhood. So he actually listens to the podcast regularly. He heard... Good, good for him. Yeah, good. He's a good man. Yeah. Uh, he heard what we were talking about with, with victimhood, and he wanted to explore that as associated with coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, and yeah. and which I think is a great topic. And I think that it becomes so easy for us to push responsibility of of our lives onto external oh, factors absolutely. absolutely and and that's just a real victim position yeah. and the problem with being in that victim position is that you have to sacrifice any real semblance of self-esteem you can't have good levels of self-esteem and perceive yourself as a victim well therein is the rub because sometimes therein is the rub th- those persons or agencies that are trying to exercise power over you, reward you with the mm-hmm. with the uh, badge of honor. You're a good sure. citizen. You're sure. a good Nazi. You're a good whatever, because you follow the leader. Mm-hmm. You don't question. You don't challenge. You don't disobey, because the leader will take you to the path of righteousness. Amen. Mm-hmm. And so for me, this is what I will tell people this is my philosophy of self-esteem is that self-esteem is immutable. Self-esteem is just a thing that you have. Everybody has a sense of self, 
Now, it could be positive, it could be negative. Um, you could see yourself as an independent agent or you could see yourself as the uh, result of conditioned forces externally, but, every, but that's immutable. That's, that, that's something that is inside of you. And so when people say, oh, let's raise your self-esteem, I always think that that's missing the point because the self-esteem is like a house and it's built on a foundation and the foundation is self-confidence. So if self-esteem is the global perception of self, self-confidence is domain specific. So each of the domains that you live in. So you could think of yourself as a good baseball player and still have low self-esteem. So you could be confident in a domain and still globally feel bad about yourself. Right. So the goal is to raise your per your perception of your self confidence in enough domains that your self esteem automatically is elevated. So not not to be pedantic, argumentative. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I, same. I, maybe the same thing. I have argued for years that there's a false self esteem movement okay. afoot in America. Oh, I our think, yeah. children are praised and rewarded. No, and, you know I agree with this. And, and, and I think that the flaw, the fly in that ointment is mm -hmm. they inherently know they don't deserve it. Right. They haven't got it. They didn't do it. But they were given the reward anyway. Right. And I think that cripples them mm -hmm. in terms of their ability to develop a healthy and accurate self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes they have to lose. Sometimes they have to fail. Sometimes they have to... Uh, be denied what they most want because without pushing against the resistance they won't grow well and i so i would say i would call that writing your own ship if you never yeah. learn yeah. How, how to, to write your own ship exactly. you don't know how to write your yeah, own ship get in a kayak turn it, it upside down right if you don't well, turn it back up you're gonna die when i was younger i was on a canoe racing team and one of the first things that they teach you is to turn your boat upside down fill it with water sink it yeah. and in water that you yeah. can't stand up yeah. in and you have to be able to pick the boat up empty it yeah. and get back in it yeah i mean that's the first thing that you learn because if you don't know how to do that guess what you're gonna die yeah and so you got to know how to do the thing that is important first. And if you never learn how to be able to write your own ship, you don't know. Yeah. And I, that's I horribly detrimental but to I, individuals. But you see these kids that are entitled mm -hmm. and they have a significant entitlement issues because I want it. And because I exist, I should have all these things. And they don't have any inner strength. Mm -hmm. uh, if they haven't And had I would say resilience. Okay, I have I mean, no problem with that yeah, word. Yeah. But but if I haven't had opportunities to fail, mm -hmm. then I don't know how to grow. I don't know how to stretch. I don't know how to push. So my parents, if they want to be good parents, have to allow me to pain. Mm -hmm. They they can support me. They can encourage me. They can give me hugs afterwards. But they have to let me fail. Mm -hmm. You know, not everybody's going to be the star in the play. Some people have to be the stagehand. Not everybody's going to be the lead singer in the band. Some people just play the radio. Mm -hmm. You've got to find the things that you can do, and you've got to find the things that you can't do. And what I tell people all the time is that no one ever learned anything from success. The idea that we learn from success is not good psychology. We learn from failure. You correct your behavior when something goes wrong. You don't correct your behavior when everything goes right. So if you never experience failure, you never learn anything. Yeah. That's not beneficial to the organism. But all of this stuff that we're talking about then feeds into a person and how they perceive of themselves. And we've listed a lot of things. So I, w I would want to go back and just kind of, you know, list some of these things. Will you have better self-esteem if you do? Yes. Okay. I'll feel better. Yeah, well, I'll have more self-confidence. One, one hopes. Uh, so the first thing that you started with was scripting, which is so hugely important. We are not in control of the script that, that other, we are we indoctrinated to. Come in control of it when we recognize yeah. that it's external. Right. We can then confront it, mm. and we can try. And so this is the old cognitive behavioral technique of there's a recorder in your head, and it's playing a message on a loop. 
yeah. and you weren't in control of what was recorded on that message right. until you recognize the message is plain and then you may not be able to eradicate the originally conditioned well, like message old answering machines yeah. had two tapes the right. outgoing message and the incoming message you couldn't change the outgoing message I tell my clients, you'll never get rid of that tape. It'll always play. What you can do is turn the volume down right? so that you barely hear it or only occasionally hear it. right? And then you can put a new tape into play to superimpose over it that you've written. Right. Yeah. And what I then even say to people is, and when you recognize that you're hearing the old yeah. tape, that's when you jump into the new tape. But the, the problem with this that people don't recognize or don't, appreciate is that it requires we've talked about we're all conditionable so you have to condition yourself to the new circumstance that means that you have to put effort into it you have to put the new message repeat the new message on a loop consistently enough that it becomes starts to become habituated you can't wait until you're in despair to say oh tell yourself good things you have to practice telling yourself good things in the best of circumstances well, so that your body will remember yeah. to tell yourself good things when it's Except that despair. when you are in despair, that's one of the paths forward. But you have to narrow the scope of your awareness. It has to get down to so micro small. You People suffering from serious suicidal depressions mm -hmm. have to learn there's value in saying, I took a shower today. I brushed my teeth. Yeah, I got out of bed. Yeah. I ate breakfast. I made breakfast. I didn't eat it. Yet. Whatever. Mm -hmm. But they have to identify accomplishments uh, to, to and, and write them down so they can measure mm -hmm. success and growth. So instead of saying, man, I've been in bed all week. I'm terribly depressed. You can challenge them and you say, how many times you get up? How many times you take a shower? How many times you brush your teeth? And you tell them each one of those is a success against the darkness mm -hmm. and the depression. And I don't know if this has been your experience. My experience oftentimes is when I say that to a client, the client will immediately say, well, I can't reward myself for getting up and taking a shower because I should do that anyway. Yeah. And that's where you hear that should. And then you, you, if you have the opportunity, you say, let's talk about what it feels like when you hear yourself say mm -hmm. that. Are you angry? Are you resentful? Because if you are, it's in response to somebody else's script that's been imposed on you. Mm -hmm. Do you feel good about it, even though it's an, a limitation? Because it came from within you. I choose mm -hmm. to demonstrate my power over myself, because I'm not a victim, by getting up and taking a shower. And you know what I say to clients when they say that is, well, are you taking a shower now? No. Okay, so then where does that should come in? You're not doing it now. Why can't you give yourself permission to reward yourself or to give yourself a compliment for taking a shower? You're not doing it now. You're telling me the should is there. So if you're not doing it and you believe you should, then you're telling yourself bad things, right? Oh yeah, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm a bad person. Okay, all I'm asking you to do is to tell yourself that if you do do it, you're a good person. And you would smell better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but they're saying, oh, I can't reward my, I can't compliment myself, right. even though I'm oh, giving myself I a negative message so for not doing it. As a child, you have a big ego. You can't say those things. Don't compliment mm -hmm. yourself. You're not such a hot thing. Uh, because there was an excessive amount of pressure to not compliment yourself. Mm -hmm. Pe people of I think our I class, was, our standing, you didn't do that. You I was, ha I was having, I was having some transference. I was getting kind of worked up. Yeah, I, it, it, there was some real transference going on there. But you seem to have taken a shower. Yeah, yeah. I did take a shower. Okay, but but just those those you know yeah, those, those messages. scripted messages. Yeah. They're damaging. Yeah, and and I mean. I, I remember, well, I'm still subject to the scripted messages that I was indoctrinated we all to. Are. Yeah. And, and, but it, 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 it's a, a thing that I feel passionate about because people can transcend that. You don't have to be a victim to that for the rest of your life unless you believe you have to be, in which case you'll be right. Amen. Amen. All right. Can so, I get an amen? Amen. All right. 
hopefully that was enjoyable and beneficial to people. And again, as we have been telling people, we love, love, love hearing from you. So please go to psychwithmike.com and send us a message and let us know what you would be interested in hearing us talk about. You can find us on Facebook at Psych with Mike, on Twitter at Psych with Mike, on TikTok at Psych with Mike, and always the home of the podcast is psychwithmike.com. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.